Okay, uh, so welcome to this video. So in the first uh, part of this video, what we're going to do is take this um, this uh, property 5 from the previous video, uh, the second bilinearity property, um, and expand it, generalize it. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is have sums of random variables on this bit and sums of random variables here, and uh, work out what the covariance is in terms of the, the individual components. And then what we're going to do is, but the main topic, the main topic of this video is uh, the variance of sums, and in particular proving that if two random variables are independent, uh, the variance of x plus y is equal to uh, the variance of x plus the variance of y. Okay, so that's, well, let us begin then. Okay, so, firstly then, uh, let's handle the covariance of sums. So, the fir let's firstly just generalise this result here. So, at the moment we have that the covariance of h and m plus n is equal to the covariance of h and m plus the covariance of h and n. Now, if we consider the covariance of, let's say, uh, g plus h and m plus n, then what is that going to be equal to? Well, uh, we can just substitute in g plus h into the, this bit of the equation, and we'll get that this is the covariance of g plus h with m plus the covariance of um, g plus h with n. Now, we can split these ones up in exactly the same way as we can split up these ones. The reason being that uh, back um, in the last video we had uh, this property here, property 2, that the covariance of h and m is equal to the covariance of m and h. So if I really wanted to do it, I could say, okay, this is equal to the covariance of m and then g plus h. So I could say, this is equal to the covariance of m and g plus h. And then I could use uh, this fact here to split that up. And then I could turn them back into what they were originally through symmetry. So I could rewrite this as the covariance of m and g plus the covariance of um, m and h. And then what I could do is split the, and could I could by symmetry then reverse them back round and say that this is the covariance of g with m, and this is the covariance of h with m. So basically, I arrive using that at the fact that uh, this distributive property here implies the other distributive property here. Okay, so if I want to expand this in total out, I've already expanded one of them, so it gives me the um, covariance. Sorry, it's not on a bit of a slant. Covariance of G with M plus the covariance of H with M. And then I get plus the covariance of G with N plus the covariance of H with N. So I get exactly what I um, would expect, basically, that it distributes in both of these. And therefore, it's almost like... Uh, uh, multiplying out polynomials that you get every possible uh, combination of the two in this way. Okay, so uh, if we uh, consider, um, if we consider, um, if we consider, um, I need a new piece of paper, getting a new piece of paper. If we now consider something a bit more complicated, if we consider the generalization of this, then we would consider the covariance of two sums like this. So the sum i is equal to 1 to n, and that's to generalize it further, let's say we have little um, scalar quantities at the front. So these are just uh, real numbers. Uh, so we're going to apply uh, both linearity properties. This is a generalization of bilinearity, basically. Ai, and then we've got a sum of random variables xi. So basically, if I write this out, this is a1x1 plus a2x2 plus all the way up to a n x n. And then we're taking the covariance of this with, again, another sum, the sum j is equal to 1 to, let's say, m of bj, uh, y, j. So these other random variables, y's. Uh, so this is equal to b1, y1, plus b2, y2, all the way along to plus bm, y, n. Okay, so we have, uh, we're taking basically the covariance of these two great sums. Okay, so uh, it's just basically like multiplying polynomials, as we've demonstrated. Formally, what you'd have to do is you'd have to prove this by induction. But uh, from intuition, what we can see is what we have to, we're going to get every term here uh, 
covariance with every term on here and we're going to so basically what I have to do is I have to start with this one a1 x1 and take its covariance with each one of these and then I have to sum over each of these so if I start with um, a i x i and I'm going to take the covariance of this uh, with each of the uh, b j y j's okay and we're going to sum over uh, j is equal to 1 to m and we're going to sum over i is equal to 1 to n. So if we do that, it will vary i uh, from 1 to n. And for each i from 1 through from one to through to n, you will vary j from 1 to n. And you'll add all of these up. Now, if we want to now apply the second uh, property of bilinear, second bilinearity property, we'll pull both of these constants out. And we'll get that this is the sum. i is equal to 1 to n. The sum, j is equal to 1 to n of a i b j the covariance of x i uh, with y j okay so that is uh, bilinearity in its fullness okay so that's enough for now now what we're going to do is we're going to consider how is this useful for taking the variance of sums and it is very very useful and this is one of the great applications of covariance of two random variables so if i take uh, the variance of a sum x plus y. In fact, let's let's go back to that example we had, where we had the population, the human population. To keep it concrete, rather than just having abstract random variables, let's keep it concrete and have the human population here is our abstract population, and we have two random variables m and n, and m is the number, the mass of the actual human body. So in kilograms, so every human on the earth has a mass. Uh, ascribed to their body and n is the mass of the clothes that human is wearing so every human has some clothes on and uh, we take all those clothes and uh, find out their mass and that is n and basically the mass of the actual human being with the clothes on is given by m plus n uh, so uh, that's another random variable which uh, goes from zero upwards okay so if we want to take the variance of m plus n how could we do it, basically? Well, uh, we can apply... Uh, where have I put it? We can apply this property, basically. And now it looks as though this property, this property 1, would only be useful to go one way. It would be... You'd think it was useful for saying, OK, if we've got covariance of h with itself, that is equal to the variance of h. But actually, it works the other way. Uh, it's actually very useful to say that this is the covariance of m plus n with m plus n. Why? Because the distributive property, we have just shown that for um, for covariance, there's a beautiful distributive law. So what we can do is split this into the covariance of m with itself, so m with m, plus the covariance of m with n, plus the covariance of n with m, plus the covariance with of n with n okay and now what we'll go what we'll use we'll use the same property again this property here uh, to take these covariances of m with itself and n with itself back into variances so this becomes uh, the variance of m and this here this bit here becomes the variance then and this bit here becomes the variance of n and these two cross terms are the same thing by the symmetry of the covariance. So we get plus two times the covariance of n with m. Okay, so we get that this is equal to the variance of m plus the variance of n plus two times the covariance of n with m. Okay, right. So, in general, the variance of m with n is not just equal to the variance of m plus the variance of m. But if this covariance term was equal to zero, then it would be true. So the covariance of n with m, now using the second, uh, second way of thinking about it, which we worked out, is the expected value of n times m minus the expected value of n times the expected value of m. If n and m are independent now, 
So uh, let's say that uh, N and M were independent, i.e. Uh, your uh, bodily mass does not affect the mass of your clothes. Obviously that's, uh, that's not going to be true because if you have a bigger body mass you're generally going to need bigger clothes, so your clothes might have more mass. Uh, but um, let's assume it's true, let's assume N and M are just random variables and they are independent, uh, then uh, what do we know? We, uh, to, we used uh, bivariate lotus to show that the expected value of n times n, if n and m are independent, is just equal to the expected value of n times the expected value of n. The way we did that, remember, was, um, if I just quickly remind you of how we proved this result, uh, if we want the expected value of n with m, that would be uh, the... Uh, to use bivariate lotus, this is just a random variable which is a function of a joint random variable, nm. So this would be n times m integrated from negative infinity to infinity, negative infinity to infinity. Of course, this is assuming they are continuous random variables. It's even easier if they're not continuous random variables because uh, you're just doing a sum then. And then we have the um, the um, the joint uh, probability density function uh, as a function of, oh I should have put big N and big N there since those are the things we're using, uh, as a function of little n and little m, dn, dm. Now if they are independent the uh, joint uh, PDF splits into the marginal PDFs as so and basically, you can then split this integral into two parts. You can say that it's the integral of negative infinity to infinity n uh, f n n d n, which is the expected value of n times negative infinity to infinity, uh, the little m times the marginal PDF of m d n, and that's the expected value of n. If it's a summation, if it's a discrete probability space, it's even easier. You just have to replace these integrals with sums. These um, uh, these PDFs with PMFs, etc. Okay, uh, so uh, basically, this is true. Uh, therefore, we can replace the expected value of m and the expected value. Uh, sorry, we can replace the expected value of n times m with the expected value of n times the expected value of m, and get that this is going to be the expected value of n. Basically, it's going to be this minus itself, so it's going to be equal to zero. So this term is going to go to zero when n and m are independent, and that is the proof that the variance of m plus n is equal to the variance of m plus the variance of n if m and n are independent. Now. Let us consider another problem. Let us consider a more uh, arbitrary problem, which is the variance of a bigger sum. So if we consider the variance of the sum of a la of an ab arbitrary number of uh, random variables, so let's say the sum of over i is equal to 1 to n of xi, so this is just x1 plus x2 plus etc. So you could think of these as, uh, if you like, the sum of n Bernoulli trials, if you like, for the binomial distribution. Or, or there are other distributions which are sums of Bernoulli distri random variables like that. For instance, the hypergeometric distribution. Okay, uh, they're not independent in that case, uh, but uh, in the bi binomial case they're independent and identically distributed, n, i, i, d. Bernoulli random variables. Okay, but you've got this sum like this, and we're going trying to take the variance of this. Well, we can apply the same trick. We can say that this is the covariance of the sum i is equal to 1 to n uh, xi, uh, or at, and the sum i is equal to 1 to n of xi. Now we can apply the distributive property, but there's a cleverer way of doing this than just saying that this is the sum i is equal to 1 to n. Uh, you could write this out as the sum. Uh, we could just uh, use exactly the formula that we've got up here uh, and say, okay, uh, we've just got two sums uh, here. Uh, where are we? Uh, we've just got two sums here. Uh, yes, okay, they're the same thing. That doesn't matter. So we could just write this out as the sum i is equal to 1 to n, the sum i is equal to 1 to n of the covariance of xi with xi. Okay, but uh, basically what this will do is it will sum up, uh, it will sum up effectively what you end up with is a great big table. So uh, you vary this i over 1, 2, 3, etc. And you vary this i over 1, 2, 3, etc. So when you start off, you start off with this one being equal to 1, and you start off with this one being equal to 1, and you get the covariance of x1 uh, with x1. Then here you get the covariance 
of x1 with x2. So now you're letting this one go to 2, you're keeping this one at 1. Then you get the covariance of x1 uh, with x3, etc. You go on. And then you finally get to the end of that, you go get, you know, the covariance of x1 with xn. And you then go on to the next row and you do the covariance of x2 with um, x1. Uh, and then the covariance of x2 with x2. But what you'll notice is that all of these off-diagonal terms are, uh, are the same. So this off-diagonal term here, the covariance of x1 with x2, is the same as the covariance of x2 with x1. If I draw some more on this, we'll down here we'll have the covariance of x3 with x1, uh, and then we'll have the covariance of x3 with x2, etc. And you'll go on all the way up to xn, the covariance of x3 with xn. And basically, this term here, uh, this off-diagonal term down here, will equal the off-diagonal term there uh, because of symmetry properties of the covariance. So, uh, it is better to write this as, firstly, we need all the diagonal terms, which you get once. But these diagonal terms, uh, if we write this as the sum i is equal to 1 to n of the covariance of xi with xi, that gets us all the diagonal terms. But we might as well apply... Uh, the one of the laws of covariance to say that this is equal to the variance of xi. So we've now got the sum of all the variances of those uh, random variables, which makes sense that this variance of this sum is equal to the sum of the variances. But then we've got these uh, these other terms to add on the correction terms. Uh, plus, uh, we could say two times, and then we just need the sum of half of this. So if we multiply it by two, we get the other half. So I basically I'm going to say goodbye to this side of the diagonal, just use this side of the diagonal, these ones up here. So I'm going to say the sum, um, let's say i is less than, strictly less than j, of the covariance of xi xj. Okay, so what, why, why does that work, basically? Because all of these terms here, the i value, the... Um, the, the, um, the term that's in front, so this x1 here, is going to, the, the subscript on it is going to be less than the subscript here, because uh, the, um, you're always going to be, you're, if you think of it as like a graph, your, your um, horizontal component is always going to be further along than your vertical component, because it's these ones down here that have the bigger vertical component than there horizontal component, and it's the diagonal terms which have their horizontal component equal to their vertical component. So these ones are always going to have their horizontal component bigger than their vertical component. Okay, so basically what this says is start with i being equal to 1, then let j go over every value. Uh, of course, i varies from um, 1 to uh, one to um, n, and j varies from 1 to n. You, they are between that, but they're also bounded by this. So you start with i being equal to 1, and you then say, OK, which values of j in this interval satisfy this? 1 clearly doesn't, so you don't use 1. You chuck that away. Uh, then j is equal to 2. That satisfies that. That gives you this term here. Then you go on, and you get all of this line all the way up to xm, because they all satisfy that. Then you go on to the next line, and you say, OK, let's start with i is equal to 2. Um, then we need a j value. You can't have j is equal to to 1 because that's actually less than the i value. You can't have j is equal to 2 because that's going to be equal to your i value. You need j to be greater than your i value. So you start with j is equal to 3. You start here and you go on all the way to your xn, etc. So you can hopefully see that you're going to get every possible term above this diagonal uh, line like that. And when you finally get to i is equal to n, then there are no j values which satisfy it. And that's because you've got this final term in the diagonal, and basically that's not going to be included. So there are no terms in that, in that category. OK, so this is a way of viewing this. So basically what we get is that the variance of a sum like this, the variance of uh, the sum i is equal to 1 to n of xi, is equal to the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the variances of the individual random variables, uh, plus 2 times the sum i is less than j of the covariance of xi and xj. 
Okay, so that is going to be useful to us, believe it or not, uh, when we come to work out things like uh, the variance of the hypergeometric distribution. And that's the way we are going to work out the variance of the hypergeometric distribution. It was something I dodged around at the time when we did the hypergeometric distribution, uh, but now we, are fin we finally have the tools for taking the variance of a hypergeometric distribution. And don't worry, I will remind you of what the hypergeometric distribution is.